Thank you. Hello. Uh, what have you let yourselves in for? Um, what I'm going to try and do over the next few minutes, I promise I won't talk at you for too long, uh, is just to give you a couple of things to, uh, to think about that might make uh, the question system, uh, the, the questions that we're going to be going into, uh, a little bit more uh, unusual, perhaps a little bit more interesting, and avoiding too many generalities, uh, perhaps even trivia. Trivia like, how did you get into expeditions in the first place? The answer, of course, was I, I got on a plane, I bought a ticket, and I went over to the Arctic, and I skied in a straight line for four months, and I tried not to die or lose any of my toes and fingers. I succeeded, and therefore I had a career. Uh, the, another thing I, I guess you could have asked is, um, do I still remember the names of all 20 of my sled dogs that I worked with up in the, in the Greenlandic High Arctic? The answer is probably if you showed me a photograph, but uh, some of the personalities were bigger than others. And I suppose the, the perennial favorite, which is how do you answer the call of nature at minus 40 degrees? The answer, I won't go into too many details, but is very swiftly and with your back to the wind. So they're hopefully the ones that we won't be uh, ticking off the list too quickly. Uh, I hope I've not just completely thrown the cat amongst the pigeons with your questions. Um, last year, I was invited over to another university city. It's uh, to the northeast of here, about, uh, about 80 miles away. And apparently over the last thousand or so years, they've built up a little bit of a rivalry with this university. And I was invited there to speak and also to try and promote the, the latest edition of one of my books. And uh, so I've just got the, the book plug in there uh, quite early on. Some of, the, some of them are, uh, are coincidentally out there in the lobby afterwards, by the way. And so what I wanted to try and do there is explain a little, a little bit more about what I did and about why I, I, I said the things that I did in that book. And it was because the, the topic of the expedition that, um, that it was about was heading up into uh, the high Arctic to live in a, a small community a place where local Greenlandic Inuit found their lives. And it's where people have been living for a very, very long time. I then went and lived there for a good period of time, a number of seasons, but then came back to my home, back to the UK, and I spoke about it and I wrote about it. And the question that I had after my talk there was actually, was it my place? Was it the right thing for me to do to write about, to delve into a way of life and a people uh, that isn't mine. I wasn't anywhere near even, uh, even part, um, uh, get, getting through any part of their language, let alone being fluent in it. And it made me think, of course, and it may well make you, you, make you think, um, did I step out of my lane when I was starting to talk about a culture that I was not born into and was not part of? So that was just a, a quick thought. Let's try this one. Let's do a bit of a, a show of hands. Who is aware that the Faroe Islands exist, the small group of, of, of islands up in the North Atlantic? A few, a, a few hands going up. OK, so the Faroe Islands, so a subarctic archipelago of islands. Um, so they were populated by Nordic people uh, many, many hundreds of years ago. Put your hands up again if you're aware that every year there are, um, there are traditions. There is, there, there is a, uh, an annual tradition of um, corralling, I guess you would say, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of whales and dolphins into one of their bays where they then butcher the animals, where they drive them in, um, into being beached and they kill them. Who is aware of that? You may have seen it in the, in the news. There were some campaigns about it. Now, who's going to raise their hand for the third question? Who thinks that should stop? Not a single hand up. That's interesting. If there was a hand, you, you can probably see which side of the line I'm going to come down on here. If someone had left their hand up, then that would have been because you, had have, you would have commented on a culture that I presume you were not born into, that you're not part of, and perhaps you shouldn't therefore have an opinion on. So what I'd like to have a little bit of a think about today, um, if the questions do go on for, uh, for long enough to sort of go, go down that avenue, is the idea of staying in your lane about what you want to try and share about the world. I decide to go to unusual parts of the world, a place that I am not from, and then share stories and to talk to people about it, to debate ideas, and to see whether there might be a good direction for us to go into secondarily. And so when you ask me, when you ask me questions, what I want to encourage you to do is not stay in your lane. Ask me about absolutely anything you like. Um, it could be about um, Alan the lifeboat, um, which has bizarrely, since the, uh, the COVID lockdown phase, become a rather large part of my life. Um, it's a, it's a converted orange lifeboat that's going to be a, a launch vehicle for, for an Arctic expedition of mine, but about any other aspect of what I do for, the li for a living. And in particular, the idea that I am actually someone who goes to parts of the world, 
I experience things, I observe, I come up with a viewpoint, and then I come back and share those ideas with other people. Um, so I'm not going to talk at you for any longer. I will now sit down and we can start the, the interrogation. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for that. Like, that was uh, some very interesting stuff, especially about the um, sharing of stories around uh, right now. And I suppose the very first questions I want to ask about that is around, you go to some of the most remotest uh, areas of the planet and you speak to some of the people that don't know anything about our civilization. Kind of, what is the reaction to you going to these communities? What, how, do, how do they react to you coming there? I think in some parts of the Arctic, they've now got used to people coming up, particularly from Europe, from North America, uh, to launch onto ice caps or onto sea ice. And so there's a, there's a small, it's not a commercialization, but they've realized that there is a market for uh, hosting people for a few days before they head off into the middle of nowhere. I was in a slightly different situation where I was actually calling this place with, with a few friends of mine. We called it home for an entire winter season, a whole spring season, and pretty much until the ice broke up at the beginning of the summer. And I wouldn't say that there was um, any resistance to us being there. There was, certainly, uh, there was certainly no hostility. There was a confusion at first. Uh, there was a language barrier, of course, that we needed to try and get over initially because English isn't really spoken there. And so we would have to do the heavy lifting in order to communicate and to, and, and to make friends, really. Uh, but it was an unusual situation because we wanted to stay there long term. We, we wanted to try and live there uh, in a traditional manner. We didn't want to hop on a skidoo and drive around at 90 miles an hour. Simply because, well, they're not available. It was a, a part of uh, northern Greenland where that sort of thing simply isn't done. And so we had to learn the skills uh, the original way. Um, which is not to say that it's uh, traveling in a, in a way that was done hundreds of years ago, the people there, you know, they're modern human beings with modern ambitions, with modern ideas and, and modern, um, uh, and, and, a, and a society that's moving um, just as fast as, our, as ours are, but holding on to parts of their cultural identity that's important. Uh, so the, the, the welcome that we, that we received was, was very, very warm, and we were offered somewhere that we could, that we could stay, um, and some of the local skills that we needed to learn if we were going to do anything more than just survive. Uh, were offered very, very generously. Interesting. So you say there's a commercialization of this kind of process almost happening in some areas. How has that changed over the past kind of couple of decades and where do you see that going? In a very small part of the Arctic. There are still huge, huge tracks because, of course, if you think about Arctic tourism, I suppose, there are, a very, small, there are very small clusters. There's the Svalbard um, Islands. There's uh, the far north of Scandinavia, which is, of course, in the Arctic, even though it it behaves slightly differently because it's got the, the, the Gulf Stream um, warming up the waters off the coastline. Um, there's then southern Greenland where there is now a, I wouldn't say it's a burgeoning tourism industry, but people can go to both western and, um, and eastern Greenland and, uh, in, the, in, the, in the spring and the summertime and, and go on tours and everything. Um, but we're only talking there about a very small part of the Arctic. There are still huge swathes, which that's really not possible in. Uh, the far uh, northern parts of, of Canada are very, very difficult to get to. If you choose to go there, it's very expensive. It needs to be nearly an expedition to, to get there in the first place. Uh, and Alaska, a very similar story. There's not a great deal going on up, up on the North Slope, which is the, the, the huge Arctic tundra on the northern edge of, uh, of Alaska. It's actually where I was, uh, where I was a, few, uh, a few months ago. There's not really much there apart from, from oil exploration and, uh, and an oil field on land which is owned by, um, by treaty, which is owned by native Alaskans. And so the land is actually leased from those people in order to, to drill for oil. Uh, and then we have Russia. Of course, northern Russia takes up a vast, vast swathe of, of the Arctic, of all the land that's in the Arctic. And let's say access there is slightly trickier than it even was a few years ago. Mm -hmm. and with these new treaties and, of course, this kind of scramble for the Arctic, which many countries are going for, mm. how, is that affecting your work in any way? Do you see it also affecting the, the locals as well and how they treat you when you come? Or is that not really an issue? I don't think so, because I'm going there for simply... Uh, well, I'm either going there to try and get from point A to point B without dying. That's normally the, the, the primary purpose of, a, of, of an expedition. Um, but I'm normally there willing to spend a little bit of money in order to stay, maybe get some provisions, and then um, maybe get launched uh, for, for, from a certain, a certain position, and then I'm out of their hair. If I was going to do something far more, um, uh, far more complicated or far, far more heavyweight, something that was, uh, that was a commercial 
enterprise, I suspect I would have more of a problem with regulation, with access, with, uh, with funding, or I would be told, I suspect, if I was wanting to, to build a large business in, in the Arctic, no matter where around the world we're talking right now, that I would probably have to do some form of profit sharing in the way that oil companies do, because there's an argument about who owns the land that these things happen on. I see. Now, of course, getting into expeditions, it's not a classic kind of nine to five job. Mm -hmm. uh, so especially with your background here at Oxford as well, what kind of shaped your career? What made you want to go in this direction? I knew very early on that I didn't want to do anything that was too obvious, anything that was um, becoming a, a part of a very large machine. I had an idea initially about what I wanted to do with my life, but I'm pleased that I went down a, a fully uh, sort of independent, not on entrepreneurial, because the point of what I do is not to simply make money by building something, growing something, and then selling it for a large amount of money. I'm trying to do something slightly different with my life. Um, but certainly my experience at university uh, gave me the ability to, uh, to analyze, to think logically, uh, hopefully to communicate. Uh, and that they gave me a, a good springboard. But I knew full well that when I, even when I was at university and I, and I was studying, I wasn't going to be uh, a, prof prof a professional academic. Uh, I knew that I didn't want to go through a, a traditional graduate recruitment scheme, if that makes sense. I wanted to go and do something my way. And that's something, certainly what I'm doing now. I think people who go into the outdoor world and they go and do something in, I guess, what you call the outdoor industry, uh, sometimes they can, uh, they, they can do it for a few years. And then they realize either there's not a great deal of money in this or they think, I've had my fun now. Let's go and get serious. Let's go and become an accountant. <laughs> it's a decision that I've not made. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I, I suppose what that then touches on, because obviously it's not the classic way of making money and you're not going to the Arctic for the same reasons as, you know, countries that want to make treaties and the commercialization that we talked about a bit earlier. So, you know, you say that these are exhibitions, uh, expeditions, sorry, just not getting from point A to point B. You know, is that the purpose that you're, you're driving for there? Is, there? is there something more to it than just that? To begin with, yes. So my first big expedition, the long haul, was simply about trying to break a big world record because you need to get people's attention. If you want to then get further support, sponsorship, a reputation, you need to go and do something big in a, in a fairly classic manner. And so the long haul was simply the longest unsupported journey because I knew that it would get the maximum attention. And I knew that because I hadn't had more than, well, it was two trading expeditions beforehand, it was something that was within my reach in terms of technical skill. Working on an ice cap uh, is very, very tricky. It's not quite as tricky as, for instance, working on sea ice, the floating skim of seawater, which is an altogether more dynamic and more dangerous system. And so I decided it was the right thing to do to begin with. That, that then morphs into different, into different cha uh, sort of not challenges, it, uh, it morphs into different projects once you've completed that first. And I, I, don't, I didn't want to start doing the same thing over and over and over again. It's why I didn't want to become a polar guide, because then you end up in, in Groundhog day, uh, day for the next couple of decades of your career, never really progressing anything. Um, and of course, if, you, if you're a guide, if you take commercial clients out onto the ice, you're never doing journeys that push you that, that hard physically and you will keep on repeating expeditions with people that you don't necessarily choose to do them with. And I wasn't really that, uh, that keen on that. So the expeditions that I choose to do now have a, have a, have a different purpose. Each one has a different, different idea. Some will be culturally interesting. Living uh, in a Greenlandic Inuit community was very important to me. Um, but also some expeditions are genuinely in the, middle of, in the middle of nowhere. Others have a scientific aspect and others don't at all. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was, it was that, uh, I suppose, that flexibility and that breadth that attracted me to doing what I do now for a living. Yeah. And with these different purposes that each expedition has, is, is there certain expeditions that you warm to more? Or is that just something, you know, you just want to leave them in the past and you go into new things every time? I, n I never want to repeat expeditions that I've already done. There, there are certainly expeditions that I've tried to do and failed to achieve. Mm -hmm. And I want to go back and give those uh, another crack. What I definitely realized when I started out, and this was during an era where there were a lot of what I would call playboy expeditions, there was a vast, vast amount of money flowing in from the city to, into teams that were not, first of all, well qualified, whether you need to be qualified or not is another matter. Um, but there were people who wanted to go and do something that they could boast about in, in the clubs for the, next, for the next few decades. And it got to the point where people were coming up with world records that were just utter nonsense. You know, pogo sticking 
backwards to the South Pole, you know, with, a, with, 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 a, with an elephant costume on, stuff like that. It was just bizarre. Um, that didn't happen, by the way. But, uh, but I decided to try and focus on the classics that were, that were innovative and technically hard. Uh, and I've also accepted that for the money that, let alone sponsors and supporters, but the money that I've myself invested, I could have quite easily simply uh, s uh, signed up to a commercial expedition to either the North or South Pole on a route that was known, not a sanitized route, but a, but, but a route that I knew full well would have been quite straightforward, tick that box and moved on. And I've decided not to do it that way. I, I'm determined that the way that I do my expeditions uh, are going to have some form of purpose, some form of meaning, beyond simply ticking a box. Definitely. And uh, one of the most striking things about your, your career is that you focus primarily on the polar regions. Hmm. You know, when did this become a choice? When, when did you decide that polar regions is where you want to go rather than somewhere else? You know, a lot of people like to go to the warmer areas, uh, but you decide to go in the exact opposite direction. I think I had a natural pull for the cold places. Uh, I didn't want to be a mountaineer because Although I suppose I could have trained as a, as a high altitude mountaineer or as a, as a, as a rock climber, uh, there are a, a great number of them and I wanted to do something which was slightly less heavily populated, I suppose you could say. I'm not very good in the heat, so jungles and deserts were, were out. Um, and I suppose I just decided that um, the sort of expeditions I wanted to do, um, they had to give me something to really get my teeth into. They had to give me a, 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 a real purpose. And I guess I was, around your age, absolutely, um, absolutely captured by uh, the early stories of expeditions, which I didn't want to try and recreate, but I wanted to try and uh, uh, add upon in the era that we're in. So that was my motivation. Any particular expeditions out of interest in history? Um, I think some of the expeditions in what's now the, the Northwest Passage Zone, the area of Northern Canada, where there was a great purpose in trying to get shipping through back in the 1700s, 1800s because it was going to be allowing potentially a new trade route. And expeditions which didn't have a, a North or a South Pole at the end of them, but had a real purpose. I, I, th I think those ones, which are now more, for, more, more often forgotten, and you hear, you hear about Franklin and expeditions where everyone died grisly deaths. But that's, that's normally what people are interested in, not what they are actually trying to achieve, uh, achieve in the first place. In fact, the people who, who discovered, who, who made first contact with the group, of, uh, the group of Inuit in the far north of Greenland, the group of people known either as polar Eskimos or known as Arctic Highlanders, there are various um, diff different names for this particular group of people up in the far north of, uh, far north of Greenland. They were found almost by accident by a group who were trying to find North Northwest Passage. They got lost. And they then came back via a, uh, an area of Greenland they thought was entirely uninhabited. And lo and behold, there on the ice were people. And so they, they stopped, they met them. And then that was, that was really the last group of, of Inuits to have contact made with the outside world. And that was as late as 1818. That we were getting towards you know, the real uh, industrial, uh, uh, the industrial changes that Europe and, and uh, other parts of the world were, were, were going through. And it must have been quite a shock. Yeah, definitely. So one of the things that's becoming very clear to me is that, you know, you're very passionate about this cultural side and the kind of people that you meet along the way and, you know, what you're saying there about we don't understand that uh, many of the cultures that you've uh, encountered now many different times. Is there anything we can learn from uh, these people that, that you meet on your expeditions? Uh, and is there anything that we should know uh, kind of about their stories that we don't hear about now? As a polar traveller, you, there's always something you can learn from people who have had their, um, their, their parents, their grandparents, all the way back through history, living there and learning lots and lots of technical skills about how to be that little bit more comfortable in that environment. So yes, on, on a purely hard skills level, yes, there's a great deal that can be learned. But of course, most people won't want to spend their entire lives learning the, the, the minutiae of how you don't die in the Arctic when you're out there in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I, think, I think about... A difficult thing that we've now entered into, and uh, this is a particular conversation that happens in, in Canada. Um, Canada has a particularly difficult relationship between um, the settler population, so the, the white population uh, derived mostly from, um, uh, from the English and the French when we first turned up a, a long time ago, and those people known either as First Nations, so those who got there um, and populated Canada and what's now obviously the United States, before the, the last ice age. And then after the ice age, other migrations came through. And far more recently, in fact, uh, an, an Inuit migration came across the Arctic through 
Alaska, Canada, and into Greenland. Uh, and I think that there is a conversation at the moment about who's got things right, who has the most important knowledge, who's, whose brand of science is better. And we get into, into a very, very awkward territory there where you have a, a terminology which is, which is now quite widespread in debate in, in North America, which is about what's known as Inuit knowledge. Um, I think it can shut down conversations. I think it can shut down proper debate because when uh, you give more than due reverence to, to ideas and to things that have been forged over centuries and centuries, uh, you stop questioning them. And I think it's important to still say that all ideas, all viewpoints, all uh, perspectives are subject to question, are subject to, to rigorous debate, surely, and none of them should be put above that. Uh, and so can we learn things? Absolutely. Having more ideas thrown into the crucible, how can that be a bad thing? Because surely the good idea should survive and the bad idea shouldn't. Uh, I spoke to someone who became a friend of mine up in northern Greenland, um, a local guy, and I was out fishing with him on the ice. You make a hole in the ice, drop down a long line into the water, sometimes hundreds of metres long, lots and lots of hooks on. The idea is to bring up as, as many halibut as you can possibly manage because your dogs are hungry, you want to feed yourselves, and so halibut are a pretty good way of achieving that. And his logic was, the more fish we take from the water, the better, the more that will come and replace them. And that, of course, on, on a micro level works because if you remove fish, their food will flourish, and therefore, there will be an opportunity for more fish. This is my biology degree. And um, more fish will, will appear to start eating that food again. But if you scale that up and you take all the fish, we know what happens. So it's a case of trying to say, yes, that does make sense. But that, if you took it as a standalone statement of, of, of fish ecology, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. But what I've just done is contravened Inuit knowledge. And I could get in trouble for that. Yeah. So how do you approach that conversation then? If it's something that's so sacred and, you know, it can shut down debate, how, in your experience, have you been able to kind of approach those difficult topics? It depends how good of friends you are with these, uh, with these people. If you spend weeks and months and months hanging out with them and they see you work on the ice competently, they start to build a respect for you and you can have a more honest conversation, you can joke with each other and maybe behind every joke, of, of course, we know there's a truth. Uh, you can try and joke in a way which actually communicates, are you actually sure that you want to take all those fish? It might be a good idea to leave a few of them at least. And of course, that, that, that moves through to every other part of um, Arctic harvesting. If you take too many of any, sort of, uh, any other form of local animal, um, in northern Greenland, it's perfectly legal to take endangered, endangered species. So uh, polar bears, narwhal, walrus, walrus are, are not endangered, but uh, there are animals which have to be looked after on, on, on a macro scale, but they are allowed to be taken locally. So if you start to make life a bit too easy on the fishermen and the hunters, and you say, well, let's take the whole lot, then you've got an absolute disaster. So controlling, that, that's why there are quotas. Uh, and so there are certain people there that I wouldn't want to have that conversation with because I'd be worried at how it would land. And there are certainly people within those communities where if you hack them off, you will no longer be welcome there and then you've really shot yourself in the foot. So it's about choosing the right person to say the right thing to at the right time. Uh, if you go across, and th th there's, a, there's a quite a big difference between how culture, and in particular the relationship between settler communities and native communities in Canada and, and, and Greenland have, um, have occurred. In Greenland there is, uh, some, some, some really bad things have happened over, over, over the decades, but there is, uh, I would say, a better relationship going on. And there are still areas where the use of too much technology is banned in, uh, in, in fishing and in, and in hunting because they want to try and keep a lid on it so it doesn't get out of control. In Canada, trophy hunting is allowed. Um, there's, of course, the, uh, the famous seal hunt, although that's more, um, more towards the, 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 Atlantic, the Atlantic seaboard rather than the, rather than the high Arctic. Um, but they have had more of a free-for-all in terms of harvesting animals. And there, there, are some, there are some awful, awful stories about people heading out in motorised boats. And these are local people heading out in motorised boats with large quantities of firearms, blasting into the water amongst pods of narwhal, and only actually being able to control and take a fraction of those that they shoot. The rest are simply left to sink, completely wasted with only a small number that are actually then brought back to shore, butchered, and used for 
the food. Um, uh, is that wise? Is that a good way of doing things? Um, and so I think that um, whilst I think it's important to offer the same sort of respect for people who live in the high Arctic that you and I have for each other, um, these people are not museum pieces, they're modern human beings, and a lot of people forget that. They think that they're, they're, they're a curiosity, of course they're not. Um, but you should still be able to question their ideas and their concepts of what is um, good science um, from what we know. Sharing ideas and sharing knowledge. Yeah, wow, that's... I mean, one, one of the things that I also think comes from that is, you know, so many people are very quick uh, in our society right now to kind of point out faults w within each other. You know, how, on a kind of, I suppose, quite an abstract level, how, how different are these people? You talk about them as modern people. Kind of how have they had to adapt in ways, you know, in this kind of sub-zero temperature, uh, in ways that are almost similar but dissimilar to us? Well, the first thing to say to that is that these are, in certain regions, hundreds of people, and then in, in other parts of the Arctic, thousands of people. Um, th the people don't act in one particular way. Of course, there will be cultural norms. There are cultural norms that you and I adopt here, and there will be cultural norms that they adopt there. Um, but of course, there are a whole mixture of different personalities there. There are people who are an absolute nightmare to deal with. There are people who are absolutely wonderful. Um, and so your question is about, uh, um, I suppose, what's the hardest thing about trying to become part of their community? What do I have to be aware of in my nature that uh, if I didn't put a lid on it might cause problems or, or stop me being part of a community? Uh, talking a lot. I, I quite like talking. Um, people there, and this is a cultural norm, almost everyone I met, I've, I've met in the Arctic who's a native of the Arctic uh, adheres to this. Um, they talk normally only if it's really necessary and they're perfectly comfortable sitting in, um, in not a, uh, an awkward silence, but happily just being around each other. Uh, and I suppose that might be a result of when you're fishing or hunting, often you will do the, the work, you'll put a line down or you'll prepare, and then you have to wait two or three hours and there's a limited amount to discuss uh, day in, day out for hours and hours and hours on end. So it becomes more normal simply to sit and have a companionship. Uh, and I suppose that's something that I had to keep an eye on when I was there because I have a natural tendency to talk at people and you know, sometimes to listen to people as well. And uh, I suppose if you didn't do that, you'd find it harder to settle in. Mm -hmm. uh, away from the cultural stuff then, kind of down back to the practical level, which you talked about briefly earlier, um, you know, what are some of the most ingenious things that you've seen uh, these communities do to survive in these kind of areas? Have you had to adopt anything from that in your own expedition? Um, yes. People don't really run there. And there's one very good reason behind that. Before there was the introduction of, of modern clothing, there's a mixture of different types of clothing worn. Uh, in, in the region that I live, there was still a lot of furs and, and skins worn. Uh, because they are locally sourced, they're not a load of plastic sent up from, from Europe, it's, it's, a, it's a far more sensible way of doing things. Uh, but those clothes don't breathe, it doesn't allow body moisture out. And one of the key things about staying alive in the Arctic, if you're doing any form of physical activity, is to allow sweat and moisture and all of that to, uh, to escape into the environment. And if you don't do that, ice forms in your clothing. And the locals learned a very, very, very long time ago that if you sweat inside your skins, you're, you'll be in a lot of trouble very quickly, it'll turn to ice. Uh, and so even if there's a, a major emergency, they all simply walk swiftly towards the emergency to go and solve it, uh, which is slightly different to our attitude. We all just run, hands flinging in the air and going, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I suppose, um, you know, on these expeditions, the, one of the things that's kind of been a, a current and what, uh, kind of a, a through stream in what you're talking about here is how deadly these expeditions can get and how um, dangerous they are. You know, what, is, what are some of the most dangerous things that you've had to uh, um, deal with in your time? I've never been attacked by a large animal. I've never had a problem like that. I'm, I'm lucky that bear encounters have always been um, at a distance. Uh, the cold you should be able to deal with, the wind, the storms you should be able to deal with, that, that isn't necessarily the, the, um, the most dangerous thing. Uh, and even crevasses, when you're, when you're working on, uh, on the glaciated part of, uh, of, of, of the Arctic. So the, the area where an ice cap breaks off towards the sea is where you'll get the most crevasses. And I've had a crevasse fall where if I shifted my weight slightly to one side on, on that occasion, I would have fallen to my death. 
absolutely guaranteed. I wasn't roped up because it would have been actually more unsafe to be roped up. Uh, but that was a moment of, of, of real fear. But I simply had to stay still, get the attention of my teammate, and I was, uh, I was whisked to safety, which was essentially a, a, a loop of rope over my shoulder. I could then get myself back onto the ice and get on with the next crevasse, because we were in a large crevasse zone of, of literally hundreds of crevasses that we had to clear that day. So there was no time to sit and have a committee meeting about how to do the next one. We just had to get on with it. Uh, but even that to the side, I think the thing that occupies my mind most is thin ice. So when, when you work on sea ice, which I say is, is a much more technically challenging thing to work on than, 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 uh, than an ice cap or an ice sheet, uh, the whole thing is always moving on, on top of the ocean. And beneath it, there's a, there's a current. And if you end up on a bit of ice that's too thin and you fall through, then it will try and grab you and pull you under. And this does happen. Uh, a few years, two friends of mine uh, were lost in Canada. So it does happen. And I suppose I've never fallen through the ice, and so I've never had the... Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bit like having never been stung by a wasp. You don't know what it's going to feel like. Uh, it's not quite the same thing. But uh, uh, having never accidentally fallen through into, in, into, the, into the, uh, the Arctic Ocean, uh, it's, the, it's the thing that probably preys on my mind most if I'm going to have one of those... Uh, go down one of those avenues of, of thinking what, what, what might happen. Uh, because there's often no way out from that. Mm. And, you know, when you're getting ready for these expeditions, there's so much you control in terms of the kind of the resources that you can bring. But, you know, as you were saying just, just to me before the interview, you, you, you're in these areas for sometimes, you know, half a year. You know, how do you get into that mindset of leaving everything behind here and going to a place that's so different to the way, that, the, the kind of lifestyle that you lead here? On my first expedition, it was a real culture shock. And it was my teammate and I, just the two of us for, uh, it was 113 days we were alone on the ice. And we simply saw it as our new home. It was our, it was our office. We got up, we had breakfast, we got on with our day's work, we put the tent up, we made dinner, we had a chat, we went to bed. And we simply repeated that for as many times as was needed to try and get to the end of the journey. And when I came home, I was, I'd just turned 22 on the ice. And so I was still living at home. And uh, apparently, I simply talked. I just broadcasted at people. I, I had forgotten to, how to do a conversation, how to have a dialogue. And so that took a little bit of time to, to, to get used to. But I, I find that these days, it's become easier. I found that I can flip between the two mindsets quite well. Uh, not just the technicality of how do you feel in the cold. When you first turn up, even if it's minus 10 degrees, you feel it's a bit cold. But then a few weeks later, minus 30, minus 35, minus 40 isn't, isn't, isn't a big deal. So your, your body acclimatizes. Uh, but because it's something I've now done, I've done that transition so many times now, it's not something that particularly bothers me. Yeah, and you know, going back to the start again, you know, where these expeditions uh, kind of began, you know, your father was an officer in the, in the Royal Navy. Do you think in your childhood somewhere there was this, always this yearning for wanting to explore and kind of that came from there? Well, there were two very different jobs, and my father in particular, uh, he was an engineer officer. He was, in, he was interested in how things work and, and how to make large machines stop breaking, and if they do break, how to make them work again. Uh, I suppose I probably picked up a little bit of that, and I, I like to try and innovate and develop equipment, and I like to, well, I often uh, make a phone call to say, you know, do you reckon this will work when I'm trying to come up with my newest bizarre invention? Um, but no, they're, they're, two, they're two very, very different lifestyles, two very different motivations. And I think uh, even though I think my, my father was able to, to travel a great deal when he was, when he was uh, in the Royal Navy, uh, I think he finds what I do for a, li for a living to be very surreal. Um, he said to me that the idea of having a, a career where you, you don't know how much you're going to earn next month, there's almost no certainty about anything. Um, he said that that was something that he found bizarre. And, and, and thankfully, that's, well, that's quite useful for me, because if everyone found that a very comfortable way of life, then I'd have a lot more competition than I have now. Yeah, definitely. And I suppose, you know, I, I, right at the very start, we were talking about how this is such a, a kind of unique uh, job to go into, as it were. Uh, and, you know, at uni, and when you were um, thinking, you know, this is something that I might want to uh, get involved with, were there any particular things that you... Uh, like societies or clubs even, or skills that you had to develop that you think made you stand out from everybody else? Well, you're assuming that I stood out from yeah. everyone else. Um, <laughs> uh, honestly, no. Um, 
I very much enjoyed my time here. I enjoyed my degree to a point. I found that um, I was interested in argument and debate and discussing some, some ideas, and I became frustrated, I'll be honest, at sometimes having to simply memorize information parrot fashion. I found that, uh, I found that challenging. Um, and the truth is, I, I did sort of fall out of love with my degree a bit. Um, but I decided that it was a place I wanted to carry on being in until I, until, I, until I graduated because I was around people that I thought were interesting and were going to stay part of my life and indeed my closest friends now are my university friends. Um, so the university gave me something different to an academic education perhaps. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, going into your uh, kind of next uh, chapter of what these expeditions look like, the, the next one uh, called, the, you know, a dark ice project. What does that involve? What does that entail? Uh, I first came up with that idea. I, I coined that, that term, that phrase uh, a decade ago now. <laughs> and it's an idea of trying to get people from land, wherever that land is, onto the Arctic Ocean and to the North Pole in full winter conditions and to do it without help from the outside world. And most people go to the Arctic and travel on the Arctic Ocean in a sensible time of year, which is the springtime, and that's when the temperatures are low enough for the ice to still be in good condition, but the sun is in the sky for a good part of the day. Uh, and, I, and I decided that I wanted to try and do this with the sun below the horizon for the duration. And um, There are some people who will claim that this, that this journey has been done. Um, there was a, a Russian and a Norwegian expedition um, over 10, uh, no, nearly 10 years ago now. Um, one expedition was unsupported, so it didn't involve resupplies, but got to, the, got to the pole after the rising of the sun. And therefore, I'm afraid I can't consider that to have been a full winter condi uh, conditions expedition. And then the other one, the Russian expedition, received resupplies, so airdrops. And they did get there before uh, the, ri uh, the rising of the sun. So I still consider that there is a, a case to get a group of human beings from land to the North Pole fully self-sufficiently uh, in full winter conditions, and that's what I'm really dedicated to trying to achieve. We've had a little bit of bad luck along, along the way. We had, um, on our first serious attempt, we had the ice break up in the wrong place, and so we would have been guaranteed a very, very embarrassing rescue if we had got onto that bit of broken ice. So we decided to postpone before even launching, uh, and then we went through the whole process of refundraising the whole th these are not cheap and we managed to get all the support together for 2020 and as we know 2020 was a fantastic year and, and so back to square one again mm. so you know you've clearly come up in this project against adversity and failure that's on a kind of almost macro level where you're having to deal with lack of fundraising or things just kind of not going your way can you apply any of that mindset to you know when you're on the ice uh, and you know, you're suddenly caught in a deadly uh, interaction and you need to get out of there quickly or, or the expedition just falls apart. You know, how do you deal with that in the middle of uh, sub-zero conditions? I would love to make a sort of a clever, mot clever motivational speaker link between challenges I experience in my business life and challenges that I experience <laughs> in my expedition life, but no. Um, I have a problem-solving brain, but no, the challenges that you experience on the ice are, are, are totally different to the ones you experience in the business world. Uh, you can also normally rely on, um, on teammates in a different way when you're in the Arctic because your lives depend on it. Um, in my experience, people tend to behave better on the ice than they do in a business environment. You can read into that what you wish. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, <dear. laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, I'm very keen on opening up the uh, floor to questions uh, so that you guys have a chance to ask whatever you want to Alex. So um, does anybody have a question for Alex now? No need to stay in your lane. You can yeah, ask whatever you like. Just the uh, lady in the brown jumper there. Um, I don't know that much about your work, so I apologize if this is a really ignorant question, but um, on top of sort of like your physical adventures and like having sort of got like more of an insight into other sort of cultures, the Inuit culture, has it compelled you to take any interest in like the politics of those cultures in response to sort of like policies of climate change and, and land use and stuff, or not? It has certainly, and, and in particular, if you're, if you're focusing on climate change, it's not really gonna have a big effect on my career because if the ice gets worse in the springtime, I will simply travel earlier. 
And of course, because I'm a winter specialist, I will simply travel in the winter time when the ice is generally in a, in a better condition. I can always adapt to the timings of my journeys. Um, so you come to the, exactly the right point. The, the people who are actually going to suffer are the people who live there year round. Uh, and I'll just give you one illustration of how much things are changing there. And I, I, th I think it's very, very easy for people to look at graphs and intentionally or unintentionally misinterpret graphs. Uh, but this is how it looks like on the ground. The people who uh, I live with in, in northern Greenland, uh, they used to be able to get onto the, the sea ice to get out and travel and fish and hunt in October time. And they might be able to stay on the ice until the following July. The summer times were pretty brief when they would have to then use boats, kayaks. Uh, one generation on, so the timing that I, that I turned up there, they're now really lucky if they can get on the ice by Christmas time. And often they're off the ice by May, June, if they're very, very lucky. That's one generation. So is that political? <laughs> it's political. Because there's a group of people now, that, um, so living in the far north of Greenland, there's three, let's say, three and a half communities now of people. The number of communities are, are reducing as people move to the one larger settlement called Kanak. And um, there appears to be a political desire within Greenland to empty out the far north, or in fact, most of the remote parts of Greenland, because they're subsidized. Uh, fuel, transport, various other things are subsidized there because they're not, uh, they're not, they're not able to fish at a commercially sustainable level for, for export. Uh, and I'm very, very critical of the Green Nanak government and the government before this Green Nanak government in that I think they're fighting their own people. They are absolutely obsessed with becoming leaders on the world stage. Uh, to being uh, leaders of, of a sovereign nation. There's, a, there's an independence movement which has gone in and out of favor in, in Greenland over the years. Um, and I think that right now would be a terrible, terrible time to do that because there isn't the infrastructure there that's ready to do that. Uh, and the people who are suffering are the people who live in the villages. And that's most Greenlanders. Most Greenlandic Inuit do not live in a couple of larger towns in the south. And I'm afraid the people who, who lead Greenland, normally they've headed over to Denmark for university and education and they've gone back to Greenland and they treat it like their toy and I think it's awful and it's the Greenlanders that suffer from that uh, so yes there is a uh, my, my, my focus is often going to be Greenland because where it's, I've spent the most of my time uh, I've spent less time in, in Arctic Alaska and Arctic Canada uh, but yes there is a lot of geopolitics going on now about the Arctic in particular. Of course, there's also the Northern Sea Route north of Russia for shipping lanes and various other things. Uh, but focusing on, on Greenland, my concern is because they have a great deal of natural resources. They have uranium, they have aluminium, they have, uh, I'm not sure if they have diamonds, but they have gold uh, and they have oil and gas. My concern is that uh, the wrong government at the wrong time will simply sell the whole lot to the highest bidder. And I don't think the highest bidders have the Greenlanders best interest at heart. Are there any other questions from the floor? Brilliant. Just the, oh, I mean, you could just pass it over right to the person next to you, yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you had any opinions on polar tourism. Do I have any opinions on polar tourism? <laughs> <laughs> um, in 2017, I went up to Svalbard, Spitsbergen where there is uh, a small town, a small Norwegian governed town. Um, if, if you don't know about Svalbard, it's governed by a treaty. Um, and it's, uh, there are all sorts of signatories to the treaty, but generally it's dominated by Norwegian and Russian interests. Uh, there's a large Russian town, Russian Ukrainian town, there's a large Norwegian town. Uh, but the government is based in the Norwegian area. And most of the industry there used to be coal. And of course, coal is no longer a particularly um, popular thing to be involved in. And so that, that industry is, is ramping down pretty quickly. And surrounding that, they had a, an offshoot from a Norwegian university that allows people to go and study Arctic science there and various other things. But actually, the way that they realized they would have to start making money in Svalbard is by having tourists over. And it's become an absolute circus. It's, it's a deeply, deeply depressing place to be, mostly in the summertime when the cruise ships turn up. They flood this tiny town, buy a load of overpriced rubbish, and then get back on their ship again to have a free dinner without spending any serious money in, uh, in town on, you know, in, in local restaurants. And then they head out on 
dozens and dozens and dozens of skidoos all lined up in, in, in neat rows, paying a, a, an exorbitant amount of money. Uh, and when I was up there, I was terrified by the low standard of guiding. Um, there was, um, there's also dog sled guided uh, tours there. And um, there were people guiding tours there in the dark, in the evenings into the dark, where there were polar bears known to be in the area with guides that had only been then there themselves for a couple of months and did not know how to use their rifle. It, that is simply rampant tourism. Uh, and it's not a good idea. I suspect the best thing for Svalbard would be if people left it alone. Svalbard has no native population. The coal is no longer a useful thing to be mining there. Uh, I'm sure that it, there would be a case for having some stations kept running for, for scientific research. I suspect otherwise we should probably leave Svalbard to itself. That would be a good idea. Um, uh, just as a follow-up yeah. to that, I was just wondering, you know, are there certain areas then that we should leave alone compared to other areas that you'd actually encourage tourism in? Uh, and if so, what would be the difference? I don't think I should get to choose where people get to go in the Arctic, I'm, uh, but no, nor should anyone else. Uh, different parts of the Arctic are, are, are governed in, in different ways. Uh, the Antarctic is an altogether different matter, and I'm not really an Antarctic guy yet, so I'm, I'm mostly um, interested in the North. Um, different parts of the Arctic have different governance. And so the vast Canadian far north uh, is more or less a free-for-all. There are almost no restrictions as, as to what you can go and do up there uh, because it's simply considered to be their wilderness and they don't have that many restrictions. Uh, the Norwegians are rather more keen on rules and regulations. And so uh, you could start up your own guiding business, tour business, and run, uh, and run tourism across all parts of, of, of the Canadian north, the, the Alaskan north, uh, uh, similar sort of thing. Uh, I see no particular problem with that as long as they don't break laws and as long as they take reasonable precautions to not leave rubbish all over the place, for instance. Uh, Svalbard is a different sort of place because it's much, much smaller. It's far more concentrated and it's governed in a sort of a... The treaty is a strange thing. And so it's enormously regulated there and that means that people's Arctic experiences are very constrained. There's not very much opportunity for free and easy access. Uh, I can't really comment about tourism in, in, in Arctic Russia. Generally, in Arctic Russia, large zones are simply closed to outsiders. There are, there'll be military installations, there are closed industrial towns. It's simply not a place where people normally want to go. It's also where they did a huge amount of nuclear testing during the Cold War, and there'll still be radiation issues up there. So I don't suspect that's going to become a, a hive of activity for tourism. Um, quite yet, um, for other reasons perhaps as well. Uh, do I think there should be Arctic tourism? Yes, there's no reason why people shouldn't go and experience the Arctic, and it would be ridiculously arrogant of me to say that I'm allowed to go and do my expeditions because it's my job, or because I've chosen for it to be my job, but you, because you simply want to go and do a dog sled ride, no, no, you're, you're not worthy, you can't go there, that would just be outrageous. Uh, no, I, th I think there will be a natural ebb and flow in different parts of the Arctic that people get access to. There will then be uh, a change in politics, like I suspect will happen in, in Svalbard. Uh, and I think the right decision would be then to leave that, that area alone. There's parts of Greenland in the, on, on the western coast which is re reasonably accessible. At the moment, there's only one place where an, a proper jet airliner can land. And that's at, a, at an old US base, US air base. And so people have got access to certain parts of Western Greenland where there are now hotels and restaurants. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's, um, it's not a frontier town anymore. So somewhere like Alunasat, where you can go on, on tours. Uh, I think they've got, they've got that pretty much right. They're not allowing whole scale expansion of the town and throwing everything at it. They're slowly seeing what happens and they're seeing what sort of interest there is in people, uh, for, for, for people going there. I think it makes sense for there to be a few well-organised hubs where people can go and experience the Arctic and, uh, and go and see it for themselves. Because, of course, and I'm, of course, not even the hundredth person to coin this. You know, if, if, you, if you see somewhere for yourself, you're more likely to want to do something to stop it disappearing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, are there any other questions from the floor here? Brilliant. Just the lady in the orange shirt there. Thank you. Um, 
I would imagine that having the right teams is crucial for your expeditions. You're not only putting your life in their hands, but you're also spending a lot of time with these people. What are you thinking about when you're selecting teams and looking for teammates? My attitude when I put teams together is to try not to compare CVs, to look at simply what their, their hard technical skills are, because you can be as good as you like, um, but you can still be an absolute nightmare to spend even one night in a tent with. And so I try to look for personality more than anything else. And that, that normally works out well. So I, I'd far rather someone either learn on the job a bit. I mean, I learned on the job. At the beginning of the long haul journey, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Uh, the first 100 miles was simply making mistake after mistake, and we slowly got less and less bad as we went on. Uh, and so I simply try and have a team of people that, first of all, aren't too similar to each other, because I don't want an expedition where there's simply a clone of me. I mean, that's a pretty horrendous idea. Um, but people who have the same background, skill set, and attitude towards solving problems. I want to have people who have different ways of, of, of getting around issues, of, of, of getting over obstacles, because then you'll be a stronger team as a result. Of course, you need to be able to gel. You can't have four people or three people who are totally different in, in, in worldview and outlook, because it, you, you will not survive the conversations in the tents in the evenings. Uh, so yeah, I, I, try, I try and focus on not the soft skills, but simply their personality and who I think might be a good companion. Because if you're going to be on the ice for months, uh, even, even just for weeks, uh, then the, the way that you perform is, is going to be down to how you can gel as a team. Uh, it's useful if someone does have some outdoor skill. Uh, knowing how to put a tent up and down is, a, is useful. Uh, but everything beyond that you can pretty much teach. I think we've got time for just a couple more questions. Anybody else? Brilliant. Just the uh, lady down there. Yeah, and the glass. If you want to stand up while you're giving your question, then you'll get on the, the camera. Um, what would you say is the meaning of your journeys? Oh, excellent. We got to the, uh, the nice, easy finishing question. Um, the meaning for me I have a number. I want to have the opportunity to do this for a living. And for that reason, I need to do some journeys um, that other people find, if not significant, at least mildly interesting. And so doing journeys that haven't been done before across new routes and doing them in different ways, that's going to get a little bit of interest. And so that then allows me to allow the, the nuts and bolts of my career to move forward. Um, what's the meaning of them for my long-term purpose? Uh, they allow me a great deal of freedom within my career where I, where I can also allow other different branches to come off of the main hub of the journeys. So it gives me that freedom where I don't simply have to work 16 hour days on a job that gives me no opportunity for anything else. Uh, and it means that I can gain a perspective on the world which I don't think I would get in an office. And to meet people, yes I understand I'm not travelling through Southeast Asia or Africa, so I'll be missing out on people's cultural viewpoints in, in those places, but at least I can go to one part of the world and understand a little bit more about it. And then I can translate that back into uh, the, 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 the subsequent stages of my, of my life and my career where I want to comment on things more. I want to come up with ideas about how we behave to each, um, uh, between smaller groups and, and, be and between larger groups. Uh, and so I think that the meaning for expeditions for me, apart from uh, allowing me to, to, to pay for my, my own food um, is to give me the freedom to think and then to do something maybe in the next step that I find particularly useful. So is it a stepping stone? No, because I love what I do. Um, but it's certainly not something I simply want to do for its own sake. As I was saying earlier, if I became a, a guide simply showing either novices or intermediate level people how to how to get across a bit, a, a bit of ice safely, uh, it would be a far easier career, far less stress. You simply get your team, you go and do the job and you come back again. And you simply repeat that every single year. Uh, that's not of interest to me. I see this as being something where I learn more than anything else. Mm. Oh, we've got time for one final question. Oh, just a little bit. Uh, just if you, the microphone's just coming in your direction, there you are. You have uh, um, said throughout that you've learned a lot, you've enriched yourself a lot, but what do you give back to the community? 
Uh, that, that is by far the, um, the most in, incisive of the lot. Um, what do I give back? I think, I think in the short term, I'm offering a window into a part of the world that a lot of people, if they really wanted to, could visit themselves, but simply don't have the time or the opportunity to visit. And I think that if one person out of however, uh, however, however many billion of us there are in the world, one person is dedicated to um, just in this, to, to this audience, in, in, my, in, my, um, in my arena, to sharing, um, sharing the viewpoints of people who lived in the places that I've traveled um, and a perspective of someone who has done some very, very difficult physical things. Um, I think that that is a reasonable thing to try and offer in the short term. In the long term, I think it allows me something of a platform. I mean, the fact that I'm sat, sat here means that I'm extremely lucky. I'm able to speak to not only you, but the people who maybe will be watching this online afterwards. Um, it gives me the platform to then secondarily talk about other issues. Um, do I think that that's going to be of value to society? You may decide not when I finally come out with, with, with the ideas that I want to try and, uh, that I want to try and share. But I, I, I have wider ideas about society, culture, and the way that we interact with each other. Um, I, have inter I, I have interests um, from the idea of, uh, of faith and, and whether I think faith is a particularly good idea or not, um, the ways that different countries interact with each other and the way that, uh, even on, on a more micro level, the way that teammates work with each other and the way, and the way that that could uh, progress through time. So uh, I suppose it's down to your opinion in, in the next decade, two decades, if I'm lucky enough to be working in three decades' time, whether I'm actually delivering something back. Uh, have I been a net recipient of wonderful experiences thus far? Probably. But I'm now on the next step of trying to share what I've learned with other people. Um, and it's, it's really, I hope, just the beginning. I'm afraid we all, that's all we have time for uh, from the floor. But one very final thing that we ask all our speakers here at the Oxford Union is if you had one piece of advice uh, for our members to think about for the next week, what would that piece of advice be? Stay broad. Um, I made a mistake during my formal education when I decided I'm, I'm good at this, I can do this, so I will do this and only this. And it was a mistake. Um, it meant that in, I, I, I'm now not a particularly talented linguist. Uh, that is an understatement. And that's been a problem for me. I've had to work an awful lot harder than some other people might. And so at a stage of people's uh, education and careers where they're still able to do all sorts of different things, do so. Even if you, quite, if, even if you can't quite see the purpose right now, it genuinely is. Uh, in particular, writing in long form was something that as a, as, as a science uh, undergrad, undergrad uh, although biology is, is, is in part a, uh, an essay subject here, uh, it's, uh, it's a skill which I've had to sort of re, relearn, I suppose. Um, and so, yes, yeah, don't, don't narrow it down too much. Try and keep as broad as you possibly can. Definitely. Thank you so much, Alex. It's been an absolute pleasure interviewing you. If everyone would put their hands together for Mr. Herbert. Thank you very much. Thanks.